and you I want you to describe the state that you were in when we when you decided to contact me oh boy um just I just could not live the way I was living anymore it was just this drive to eat all the time and think about food all the time and how um, often did you think about your size your weight in food a day what, uh, what percentage most, of the day most of my day most like, of my day I don't know um, probably 75 percent at least of my time yeah that was my life that's been my life for I don't know how long how old are you and, 61. So you're 61, and would you say you've been obs obsessed, really, about your size, shape, um, and weight since you were a child? No, no. Actually, it was probably since the, definitely been the last maybe 15 years. Okay. But the diet, the religious uh, food mentality where food was, what was going to make me healthy, that's been going on for 30 years. Okay, so food food righteousness or health identity, yes. right? Yes. Controlling the yes. health of your body, maintaining your thinness for over 30 years. So since you were in your 30s, 20 well, to no, it, Yeah, well, actually, the, like I said, the thinness has only been since 15, it, it's only been 50, half of that time. The rest of it was more for my health reasons, and it wasn't until I got married and my husband kind of liked me being thin and put me on a cut so I kept buying clothes for me that then I felt like I had to maintain the thinness. And that's why I added not only the food religion to my catalog of who I was, but it was also then I had to stay thin. So it was two reasons for watching what I ate. So when did the binging get worse for you? Like when did full-on binges start to happen? I guess as I'm getting older, maybe hormones changed or something, and, um, um, well, let's see, I was raw vegan for a little bit over a year, and then I went into paleo, and all of a sudden started gaining weight, and, um, and it was at the recommendation of my acupuncturist, because she said that I was unhealthy being raw vegan for so long, so I started being paleo, and as I started gaining weight, I freaked out. Because all of a sudden, there goes my thin body that my husband loves so much. So you went from raw vegan to paleo. Just you, you went from one religious zealot to another religious zealot, right? Yeah, yeah. You've done like you, you've mentioned doing like six day water cleanses. How many? Do you, do you think you could count how many cleanses you've done? Oh my gosh, no, too many, too many. But I, and I and uh, actually, I can't count how many diets. I've been on. From macrobiotic was the first one for 15 years. A 15 year macrobiotic one, diet, okay. I'm sorry? Go ahead, I'm just re repeated it so the listener can hear it. Okay. And so you've been, for 15 years you did that, and would you say you were very righteous about it? Very like, I'm yes. so healthy. And you, were, you judged all these people. Look yes. at them, they're so unhealthy. I can't believe they're eating that. I can't believe they feed their kids that crap, right? Yeah. Okay, so we've been working together for a couple of weeks and it's, it's been it's been hard, right? It's been hard. Yeah. Cuz you oh have God. this suffering that is so deadly. Feels like death, feels awful. You can't you can't imagine life any longer with this suffering. It's gotten to the point where you just are desperate for help to get out. You've got that sense of um, suffering compared to this identity around who am I if I don't have the perfect, healthy, thin body. You had to go through, will my husband leave me? If I let this behavior go that creates all this suffering, will he leave me? You know, will I get morbidly obese, like my emotions tell me, right? Will I have type 2 diabetes overnight, like all the fear-mongering food zealots say? 
will I end up with cancer right now? You know, you have to go into those cognitively distorted um, messages that you've believed in, that you've been brainwashed to think are true and real and fear mongered into and you have to really go into the vulnerability of, of an abyss that you don't know anything about right so you can right. stick with what you know and what you have been obsessed over and what you've had the ego and self-righteousness with but causes all of this pain and suffering or you have to go into your fear what you're afraid of release this ego Put yourself with the common person that you've put yourself above and, and not and go into where you really don't know how to survive. Take that risk, right? Right. And tell me how you feel today. Excited about my new life. Yeah, how does it feel? You, we, our last session, you, um, just to keep it short, we had done, what is this, our like fifth, sixth session that we, we've been meeting like two times a week. It's been really consistent. Right. Because of the intensity of your issues, right? Right. Uh -huh. um, every few days. And it was very hard. We had to look at, I had to hold up a mirror, right? Like you were like, but what about my health? And I was like, you're not healthy, right? You had to really dismantle this concept of what health is, didn't you? Right. Remember I right. said, would you rather have type 2 diabetes or your mental illness? Which one's worse? The diabetes. Well, of course the diabetes. <laughs> Say that again. Mental health is worse. Yeah. And you had to really get that. You're like, oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah. This is, yeah. this mental illness is hell. Yeah, it's it's all consuming. Yeah, it is all consuming. And it's not yeah. just all consuming in a great way. It's actually 99.9% .9 poison. It's like yeah. dying, suffering, can't breathe, panic attacks, obsessive compulsiveness. This The 1% the of ego only occurs when you see someone who you judge and put yourself above, right? Right. But the rest of the time, you, you isolate yourself. You're hiding. You're full of fear. You have all these symptoms of, of um, someone who's in severe fight or flight. So it was a process and it was intense and you went and got a massage. And in brief, tell me what happened. You went to this new massage therapist you'd never been to and he basically, what did he tell you during the, he talked to you during the entire massage and what was his conversation about? Well, one of the things he said was that he was going to be teaching some um, classes at a nearby health food store um, on non-GMO, and I really needed to attend. And, and then he also told me about some woman that he knew that was very overweight, that was ate way too much sugar, and she was going to get type 2 diabetes if she didn't quit, but she just didn't have a clue. And it, it was like, uh, I, I don't want to hear this. Yeah, it, it, was it more because he was so uh, derogatory towards this poor woman? You know, he, it well, sounds like his conversation was very derogatory. Yeah. Yeah. So you go in for this massage that you paid for to someone you don't know, and they just start, they start going into food righteousness. Not that I don't agree with the GMO stuff, but the morality behind it is like, that's not okay. It's not okay. Do you see that yeah, now? Yeah, it's like preaching uh, religion to someone when you don't have a clue what they believe in. It's like people have a right to believe what they want to believe. Of course they do. Right? And so here you are coming off of years of obsessive compulsive um, an eating disorder, really, orthorexia, turning uh -huh. into anorexia and all of this, and you're getting my help, and this guy's starting to fear-monger you into, into food religion again. He had no idea every, all the stuff that you'd done. And he kept on going, didn't he? And you were like, you were, to some degree, um, arguing with him, but it changed. 
he started to talk about this stuff and you started to go, yeah, what if he's right? Oh my God, I shouldn't be eating all this food. Didn't it? It flipped for you, right? Right. And then you started to think, I'm the bad guy. Right. Like she's making me eat from this table of abundance crap. And my health is going to go to pot. And then you kind of went and you went home and binged. Right. And then it was like you didn't even want to call me or talk to me anymore because you felt like this was just so stupid. Right? Yeah. I put you, I put you off today. I put your uh, appointment off today because I didn't know how to deal with you at the same time. So. I, I could tell because you're like postponed. You didn't say I need to reschedule. I need to postpone our next session. But anyway. <laughs> Everybody kind of goes through this martyr. There's a there's a martyr stage, and I think it's so important that well, everybody it, goes through it, it because it has to be your know. responsibility. It can't be my responsibility or that asshole's responsibility. Right? You cannot right. give your being to me or to him. It's your responsibility. And so we talked, and we went through this, and I said, you know what? You're the one who is suffering. You know, you're the one who came to me to get rid of the suffering. So if you don't want to get rid of this mm. severe um, psychological circumstance, then go back to that. Go back to eating, you know, religiously, right? You're the one that had to take the ownership of it. And how has it been since that conversation? That conversation was three days ago. How have the last three days been since you changed? Awesome. It was, okay, it was really hard. It was really hard. But the last day has been wonderful. It's like I had to get to the point where I could get used to what it felt like to eat and just not let the food be an, an issue and not let it have any kind of symbolic um, where I had no attachment to the food um, as far as how it affected my health, my uh, my appearance. Just get rid of all these attachments. With yes. Food. Okay, this just part of this something. video is very important. Start taking notes, people. The key here was for you to remove the morality and symbolism of the food. No matter how you look at it. You had to get rid of the vegan belief system, the paleo belief system, the the caloric belief system, the sh the sugar is addictive bullshit. All of that crap that's out there that is there to give someone power, you had to ignore it. Right? Because you also right. thought you were addicted. Yeah. You thought you were addicted to sugar and food. Tell me what your thoughts are about it now after giving yourself Freedom to eat sugar every time you're hungry if you want it. Anything you want, you have available to you at this point. There is no limitation and no morality. So by removing that morality, what happened to your impulses to overeat? They're gone. Like, like this. Fast. Over. Yep. It took your, yep. it really took yep. you accepting too though, and I was just saying this. You had to accept, in order for that pressure and morality to go away, you had to completely detach from your body. Do you understand that? Yeah. You had to say, I am not in charge of this body. I'm not going to pretend that I am the smartest health person in the world. I'm not going to pretend that I really know what's going on here. Because clearly the suffering indicates that I'm the furthest thing from healthy, right? In your, right. you know, macrobiotic diet. So you have to let it go and see what happens. And you decided not to judge and shame the food you've been eating. So you made homemade banana bread. <gasps> oh my God! Wheat the bananas turning into sugar. Don't forget the actual sugar you added, right? Right. You decided, I will wait till I'm hungry, and I'm going to have some. So you waited, and you're not very hungry very often. So it's been a few days. You got hungry, and you're like, 
you sliced a piece of banana bread, sat down, and how did that go? Did you binge on it? Did the impulses take over? No. What happened? No. I didn't eat it all. I mean, I had, you know, I had the slice. That was it. That's all I needed. Yeah. And before, what would have happened? I probably would have eaten the whole thing because I would have started eating it and then feeling guilty. That. In fact, I probably would have only eaten it if I had been stressed and upset and and probably had some kind of emotional thing going on, and it was a form of punishment to myself. Yeah. So you would have wait. You would have held held yourself away from it. So I can't eat yeah. it. And then you would have right. been thinking about it. And then you would have been stressed out about something. Which, have you noticed you're not as stressed out? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the symptoms are should be just like, gone. So you'll notice the stress is gone in your life. That you're more laid back. That you feel like you can breathe. That your mind is more conscious. That you're thinking a little deeper. And that you're more relaxed. And you're, you should feel like happy. And it should I'm really excited about life. Yes, really okay. Yeah. But do you see that the only route to this was for you to completely leave body, image, identity, and religion? You are not the health of your body. You are not the sex of your body. You are not the food within the body. You are not the body's diabetes or lack thereof, right? Right. And so what that does, if you can let the body just be what it is, and that's what you had to do. Right. Let it tell me when I'm hungry. Let it tell me how much I need to eat. Yep. And, and notice, up, and what's, it. what's the stress around it now? I mean, because you were really stressed for the first two weeks about all of it because of the yeah. body image stuff we had to work on. Could you have had... These, this state of relaxation if you still believed in thin and health righteousness. No. Thank you. It's, it's impossible. It, do you even right. see? It's impossible. You can't. Because you have to constantly, you know, filter what you're eating if it's appropriate and if it's not. And if it's not, you can't have it. And what do you think that does to your relationship with that food? Uh, it makes it very dysfunctional, right? So if you have a bite, if you, let's just say, I can only have two bites, what happens? Because you were doing that the first week. I can only have two bites, what happened? You can't and stop. The stress about the two bites means that I'm not going to have two bites. I'm going to have so much more. And then you feel like you failed. Right? And then you're like, I have to fix it tomorrow because I'm going to be fat and unhealthy. So I have to eat the whole thing until it's gone. Do you remember you did that? And I said, oh, go buy a whole new pack now. And you're like, what? I just ate the whole pack thinking it had to go away. And I was like, no, you're going to go get more. And you're like, well, crap, I wouldn't have eaten the whole thing if I knew I had to get more. <gasps> you're not addicted. That right there is a sign. If you were not addicted, you wouldn't have yeah. eaten the whole thing. You ate it because there's reasoning behind it. It's not just this, oh my God, it's like so, I'm making, I'm getting so high, I can't handle it, right? It was not the food. It was not, it had not been the food all along. It was never the food. It was my, my thinking that I had to eat this food or else I wouldn't have been here. And she tight, but I couldn't see it. I needed you to kind of like help me pull apart yeah. what was going on and yeah. what actually was there because it was just so bound tightly together. It was like a mess of all yarn that I needed somebody to come and like pull it apart and say, okay, this is this and this is this. And you see all this is wrapped up. Yeah. I, I was just too messed up with all of it to see what was going on. Yeah, and I have to say that for that to occur, for me to have had that ability to say, no, 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 that's not what that is, because you had all sorts of beliefs that kept it tight, right? You had to have the humility to hear it and go, she's right. Crap. The belief I had that made me feel righteous is wrong. That's what had to, that's the only way I was able to do that for you. You were humble enough, suffering enough, that you were listening and willing to hear 
what you didn't want to hear. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. suffering and, and uh, humility, I guess. Well, think about it. You had to be willing to hear it and willing to surrender what you're doing. That tightens that ball up so tight, right? So much control. Oh, yeah. You had to be willing to surrender that. Isn't that, yeah. that's, that's humility. That's what that requires is I'm not the smartest and most healthy person on the planet. You have to kind of eat your own shit. That's like the karma that comes back. I always say that's your karma. You know, all the righteousness you had, you have to surrender it and realize that you're not better than anybody else. No matter what you think, you're the same as the 400 pound person. Yeah. Theirs is just... You know, it might be more intense. They, I, I like to um, describe this like a bunch of people in the same church. All of you are anorexic. All of you. Binge eaters are anorexic too. They're just in the back pews. The anorexics are in the front pews, all righteousness. Look at me. I'm so righteous. That's the front pew. And as you go towards the back, the binge eaters sit in the back. They believe the same crap. They just feel totally and completely ashamed of themselves. They're still worshiping the same idol at the front. Look at me, I'm so thin and righteous and healthy. You're listening to the same crap. The anorexic sit at the front, the binge eater sit at the back. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Do you see that now? Oh yeah. I know. Wow. The bulimics sit somewhere close to the front. And then it's just, it's just a grade of shame that goes towards the back of the room. There's pride in the front and shame in the back. And the people who have been binge eaters, they're the ones who, for the most part, can be the most detrimental if they get to the front because they get the, even more ego. You'd think that they'd be more compassionate, but they're not. It's kind of... A, what's going on because mm -hmm. that's how everybody is today. No, they're brainwashed. Yeah, it's a brainwashing. They actually don't see the detriment of what they're doing. Uh -uh. Not at all. They have no idea. They find out when their children have eating disorders and addictions, right? Uh -huh. And then they don't even blame their beliefs or thoughts because how could that be wrong? You know, doesn't everybody want to be thin? That could never be the problem. I was just trying to help them be healthy. Because it's so healthy to restrict sugar. It's the healthiest thing you can do. Which is really not true. You know, when you look at it emotionally and psychologically, it's very detrimental and you're more likely to binge. So, but they don't know. But they just never question their beliefs around health. Because the person that's teaching them is on a pulpit saying, we're so healthy. Look at me and my paleo. It's so sad. Because they really don't know. I honestly don't think people are maliciously brainwashing you and taking your money. I think they actually believe their own ego. And they don't think that there's any information outside of their own limited tiny little box. Because they're afraid themselves. They have the same symptoms themselves, right? Right. Anyway, so you, like the guy that was giving you the massage, do you think he questioned his own beliefs? And he was willing to preach it. At a health food story. He thought he would help me. Yeah, he did. He did. He didn't mean to life, you know? So. Mm -hmm. That you're going to be so happy when you obsess over food. It's just, it's not that simple. Right. There's a lot more going on in your survival area of the brain that's going to take over when you do that. You know, and that's what you were living in is in a state of severe um, survival because you your beliefs were such that in order for you to feel safe, you had to manage the body into a perfect vision and perfect, um, like you said, this illusion of health. You know, that was the symbolism of health, what that was. That to you was safety and security, not only in your home with your husband, but in your culture and environment, I mean, how often did you preach your health righteousness to other people, thinking they would be happy and healthier if they followed the way you ate, too? Well, that actually has been my profession, so. Oh. So with that said, you would be giving people your mental illness if they followed your paradigm. 
right? Oh yeah, I feel bad about it. Hey, I'm doing the same thing. What do you think I'm doing with you? I'm showing you a new paradigm. It's the one I'm in and I'm certain there are limits. But hey, it's not the one you're in. It's a far bigger, looser, more open environment. Am I right or wrong? It is a different paradigm if you want to look at it that way. But it's not a, I don't know, I don't think I can compare it to. Well, <clears throat> one paradigm, I love what you said about it being a tight ball. One paradigm goes in and gets tight. The other paradigm goes out and is infinite. So what I'm just teaching you is, hey, go the other direction. Give yourself yeah. a, I'm not telling you, I'm not getting rid of choices for you, am I? No, you're giving me unlimited choices. Correct. And the ability, in a sense, an ability to navigate for yourself. I'm not saying that there's no boundaries. The eating the hunger is a boundary. We could actually say that is a form of diet. The difference is the context. We're not doing it to control the body. We're letting the body tell you what to do. So you're following the messages of the body, right? It's still um, something to follow. But, and it's the only way to get out of this as far as how to eat because your body has so much more um, sense uh, about when to eat and what to eat than our, our minds do. You know, well, that's, that's very true. However, tell me this. Before, eating to hunger was not possible. Do you see why? Uh, oh, yes. And you told me that the first week. I you did. Remember, I was like, we can't even work on the hunger scale yet because you're so moral about food that it's impossible. Your impulses are going to be huger. You can't give yourself the luxury of eating to hunger because you have to. You have all this fear around your health and shape and size and weight, right? Right. You see that now? Yeah. And we, what's crazy is, like I said, I can be at my with my husband at a restaurant while he's eating and have no desire to eat any of that. If I keep checking in with my body and saying, am I hungry? Because somehow I just don't want to eat unless I'm hungry. I mean, something has happened magically in the last few days that, that has clicked in. And now I have no desire to eat unless I'm hungry. And that is just wonderful. Yeah. it is. Well, the difference is you're not being deprived. Right? There, that feeling of right. deprivation did not occur. And there is a reason why. You have given yourself the freedom of anything you want. That table of abundance is there all the time. Right. So what happens is that if you can eat, you could go back and get that. What your husband, he was like, I want a beef sandwich. And you were like, okay, you could get that beef sandwich and anything there for the rest of your life. So it kind of removes the, it really does remove this like, feeling like you can't have it, right? Before... Yeah, I, when I was at the restaurant, that I could have ordered something and taken it home with me and eaten it later, but I'm like, no, I can get anything I want whenever I want it, you know? Yes, I do know. Uh, that We had to talk about that table of abundance quite a bit. And, yeah. were, and, and, <laughs> and remember, some people say, yeah, I did that, but they really didn't. What they did is, right, you have the table of abundance with all the food you can imagine on it, and the food restocks when you eat it, so it never goes away. Then there's the table of just vegetables and chicken, right, Your or your paleo limitation. All and, and most of the table is empty. It really is. So you're sitting at that table. How do you think it feels to go out and eat You're with your husband who's eating a sandwich with bread on it and mayonnaise and, and like, whatever he's eating? It feels depriving. And you have to, in order to not feel deprived, you have to have that ego of, that's such bad food, mm, I'm not going to eat it, right? You take on that persona, but to, to survive it, oh my God, that's part of the coping mechanism that people have in terms of feeling deprived is they start to have ego around it. The other thing is, if you don't take on the ego, you just feel like you're suffering. And then you entitle yourself, well, if he's eating, I'm going to eat too. And then you're like, screw it, I've ruined everything. And what happens to the rest of your day's behavior around food? Just goes crazy. And you don't know why. You think it's the addiction to food. Because that's what someone told you who's who acted like they were super smart, right? Right. So what we did is said, you can have that food, all food, all the time. It's never going away. And tell me what that did. 
Remember that ball of yarn? What happened to that ball of yarn's tightness? It loosened it up. It opens up. Around. And now you can see it, and now you can go, oh, yeah, and you can kind of work your own head. It's not like you had to have self-discipline. Did you have to have discipline in that environment with your husband? I have to have did you have, have to have discipline yes. Did you have to have self discipline? Like did you did you feel like you had to have discipline to not eat when you were at the restaurant with your husband when you weren't not hungry? All. Not at all. You were like, ah, I'll have a uh, you you just said earlier, well I went and I wanted to I just said I'll just have some tea, but I actually went in there and sat there and thought about it and was like, I'm not even I don't even want tea, I'll just have some water. And he ate and you said you had an it was just so great. You were relaxed and easygoing, and you guys later went to a Mexican restaurant for dinner, right? Uh, no, actually, um, he wasn't hungry the rest of the night, so um, <laughs> I think he had a snack, and uh, I think I might have had something a lot later. I, I can't, I can't remember, but that's he, awesome. So you didn't even feel deprived of the Mexican restaurant that you were looking forward to. Yeah, we were we were going to, we had a coupon and we were going to go to a Mexican restaurant. I said, let's not go to uh, the beef O'Brady. Let's wait and go to the Mexican restaurant later. And then the more I thought about it, it's like, that's what you want right now. Let's go ahead. That's all right with me. And I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to wait for a long time. Hey, notice, you know? notice the adaptability that you have too. That your plans. Yeah aren't foiled and you don't have to be angry at him or feel anxiety around it. Right. That's a big freaking deal. These are your symptoms are so different now. <laughs> Those of you out there listening to that are going to go, "Oh my god, I want that. I want what she's got right now." You are now that person on the other side. How do you feel about it? Awesome. Yeah. Like I said, it's like I've stepped into a different world. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, yeah. Yeah, and you're not you're not on any medication. This is not like you took a pill that it's like an antidepressant or a self love pill that says, I'm good enough, even if no matter what the body does, right? No matter what the body does, I'm going to listen to it. So before I stop recording this, I want to make sure that we discuss the next biggest vulnerability. What do you think could potentially pull you back in to the um, body image food crazy train? Ball tight ball of yarn again. Um, I guess if I gain weight. Well, or lose weight, because that's something that you started noticing too, is that you're starting to lose oh. weight, and that started making you go crazy. We had to go through that, right? Oh yeah. <clears throat> but we've already accepted the weight gain. That's the only way you could give yourself the lenience to have the devil's banana bread that you made. I've accepted either way. Well, yeah. So, so the vulnerability is when it occurs either way, you have to separate yourself enough to realize that it has nothing to do with you, that it has no symbolism, and there's no meaning behind it. Right. Right? So right now, nothing's really changed and you're doing it. So if something changes either way, that now is the test, right? <clears throat> It'll be exciting though to see, you know, how I just don't care anymore. Yeah, so well, at this point, you just need to live the way you're living and can, and to see how you manage within within it, right? Yeah. I can't do that for you, and do I have any guidelines for you? Have I given you very strict guidelines? No, eat while hungry and stop before it gets too cold. <clears throat> well, that's the, yeah, after you've given up body image. So now you've got to be able to go in environments where body image is important. Like going out with friends, um, go, go, <clears throat> putting on a bathing suit, um, putting on jeans that you haven't worn since last year. What if they're baggy or tight? Um, those are things that you have to be able to feel and sense and experience and to, again, practice the separation from, from them. Because if you can't, what happens to this relaxation around food? If they don't fit, I give them away and go get other ones. I don't well, care. Well, good job. Okay. <laughs> but now I, it needs to happen. You need to go forward. And and almost like for me, it was like I had to I had to accept it ahead of time. 
right? I had to say, I, I, I had to gamble with the worst case scenario ahead of time for me. I remember very clearly having this out of body where I was put in a morbidly obese body that was close to 500 pounds. Your body was laying on the bench that was laying on my thighs. And I had to accept that that is going to happen to me because if I don't accept it, then I'm going to try to prevent it, right? So for right. me, I had to accept the worst case scenario. Even though intellectually I knew in that moment that I'm just going to eat to hunger and I'm not going to moralize food, I knew the binges were going to go away and they did instantaneously. And remember, I was binging 8 to 12 times a day. They went away instantly because I was just not going to moralize food anymore because I had accepted the risk of being 500 pounds which to me was the same as putting a gun to my head. So I might as well do this before I commit suicide, right? That's how it happened for me. And it was like what you're experiencing. It was almost like this within 48 hours, it just was gone. This insane area, space, belief, identity just died. And I was left in this open space. My brain was open, my thoughts were open, my character was the same, I'm in the same body, but I just don't care. Whereas before I cared so much that I was willing to commit suicide over my fear of getting fat. Yeah. Right? Wow. You did the same wow. thing. You just went through. That's all I'm doing is guiding you the way I was guided. And I wasn't guided by any person because this information does not exist. What exists is you're addicted to food. This is a disease. This is in your DNA. And you're just going to, you'll never recover. If you paid, if you went to a clinic, let's just say the Emily Clinic in Minnesota, they're going to charge you 30 to 40 grand in their in home program and tell you that you have a disease and you're going to suffer with this mental illness for the rest of your life. That's what I was told. Could you imagine that? No. Isn't that like. And that's I have been to two eating disorders up in Atlanta, the eating disorder clinics, and they didn't help me at all. So. What did they tell you? You were addicted? Well, the first one told me, I mean, I went to a lot of groups, and we did a lot of cognitive therapy and different whatever, but um, no, it wasn't that I was, it, it, I, it was, well, actually, they were truthful in one thing, is that one of my counselors told me if I just ate uh, Jiffy peanut butter, uh, just give peanut butter that I wouldn't have a problem because um, I was I needed to quit going to health food stores and I see that that was that was right yes and actually but I quit because she made me mad so well you went you were not willing to let go that's the humility part but they did put me on Zoloft because I was depressed instead of actually helping me get through why I was depressed of course so, eating disorders don't respond to medication. Why do you think? What medication is going to get rid of your desire to be health righteous? That's a belief system. That's not a mental problem. That's a belief system that is diseased. It's the belief system that's diseased. At least that's what I realized. My brain responded to that belief system. The belief system is flawed. It doesn't match our brains, the way the brain works at all. So we're taking a belief system that is activating survival, and that's all it does, and that's how where you're at. So are you flawed, or was the belief system around body image and health image flawed? Belief system is flawed. Thank you. Yeah, we removed a belief system, which feels like an exorcism. Feels like you're going to die, right? You had to go through that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you did it. And on the other side is open-mindedness. That's all you are, is open-minded now. That's what this feels like. <gasps> and it's empathy for everybody else. Oh, my yeah. gosh, what they're going through and what they don't even have a clue. You got it. And you can see someone who's health-righteous, like this massage therapist, and go, oh, that guy's suffering, and he's, he thinks that he's the king. And he's trying to give people the same suffering. He just thinks that his suffering is better than your suffering. I just don't believe people have to suffer. It's a choice. The choice comes in what you choose to believe. 
If you don't have a choice in your beliefs, like your religious beliefs, if you don't have a choice, you will never recover. When you take the choice into your hands and you're willing to turn it inside out and look at it objectively, things change. But most people don't. They're not willing to give up the ego of it, right? I'm better than you. That's what they are. They're not willing to give up because they don't want to feel lesser than you. And that's when, when I remember when I said you have to go through that, you have to eat your own shit. That's the hardest part. <laughs> it's like karma's a bitch. If you think you're better than someone in your thinness, you are going to have to learn your lesson in your fatness and realize that you're not lesser than anybody. It's like if you're thin, if you're a thin, if you're superior in your thinness, you're going to have to re undo it when you're inferior in your fatness. You have to, do, you have to get rid of the belief on the other side. And I had to do that. I had to go into, I'm going to have to be this person that I'm afraid of. And I'm going to have to dissolve my fear and choose that if that's what this is going to take, I'd rather have that than my thin righteousness. And for me, it wasn't thin ego as much as it was that's all I had. I didn't put myself above other people with it. I just felt like without this, I have nothing. Nothing. No one will accept me. I have nothing that's acceptable. So it was more of an inferiority compensation for me, which is what it all is. I just didn't, I didn't judge people who were overweight. I just, I just had a separation. Anyway, so, so here we are. And at this point, what I'm going to have you do is just keep on going, right? You went through the issues with clothes. What do I do with my thin jeans? And my, do I go buy a bunch of fat jeans? And I said, no, you're just going to stay where you're at. Let the body naturally do what it's going to do, and you're just going to accept it. You're right. gonna give yourself the freedom. You're no longer going to moralize food. All food is abundant. All food is the same. The body converts it to what it needs. There's, it has different functions, but morally it's all the same. Right? Right. And you're to just go with it. And so now you are learning your hunger rhythms. You're just now getting like, oh, this is hunger. Oh, that's what it felt like to stop eating with my body, eating banana bread with sugar and gluco and um and gluten, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. And that's eggs and oh my god, I stopped eating because I'm just does it doesn't I can have more later, right? You need to keep on doing it. You need to experiment with spaghetti, tacos, you know, that beef sandwich. You need to go to Korean food. You need to have some ice cream. You need to have, you know, a popsicle. Whatever. Remember the whole table? You need to experiment with it. And it's cool when you're on the road because, you know, one of my husband's stuff and what to get a hot dog, hey, I can get one too. Like, there is no restriction now. No, and like, you can I put am. mustard on it. Oh my God, you can put mayonnaise. You could, if you don't like mayonnaise, you can put ketchup. Oh my God, ketchup. Yeah. Don't forget the sauerkraut. Don't forget the sauerkraut. Just listen to your body. And for those of you who have a severe reaction, like an allergy, then don't eat it. It's not moral. There's no symbolism in it, right? And actually, who even knows if I really even had any of those allergies? Maybe it was just different health people along the way that were just saying things to uh, kind of, kind of uh, I don't know, be, be another cult for me to follow, you know? Of like, course. I see that all the time. Everybody okay, so has Lyme's disease way, right now. If I Everybody. Gluten, if I have gluten, I have a reaction, and it's like, okay, you know, I can eat that again if I want to feel that way, or, you know, maybe it was something else. You know? Or it could have been your fear and judgment about the food. Exactly. The fact that you're having severe panic attacks when you eat it, maybe that's creating the inflammation while you're eating. Right? That's the other thing. Before, if you ate, it was incredibly, you were fearful while you ate. And so your reaction to that food is is essentially being magnified by the fear. So people who have health righteousness and thin supremacy and thin righteousness, they tend to have a more hypersensitive reaction to food because they have fear and issues while they're eating. It's like the perfect timing. 
So if you're relaxed with your food and you're eating it and don't feel pretentious or it's going to do something, you don't have the same euphoria. And on the other side, if you're not afraid of it, it doesn't take control over you either. So it's just like this, like, huh, kind of like that feeling you had when you had the banana bread. It was like, it's no big deal. I can have some later. You took the other half and you wrapped it up and said, I'll just have it later. It didn't keep on saying, you have to come get me because you didn't do anything wrong. There was more, no shame about it. You didn't ruin anything. You didn't fail by eating it, right? All of that energy is gone and you can have more later. That right there is the key. And right now, I don't see any difference in eating a banana or eating the banana bread. It's like there is no judgment in my mind at all. Correct. And if you're eating to hunger, your body is telling you you're responding to when it says, and this is good enough. My insulin is working appropriately at this amount. The leptin is where it needs to be. All of these things are working in unison, and we're good. So you're actually using that, and it changes relative to what you choose to eat. If you chose to eat salad, it would take five to six cups of that at the time. Or it takes one half of a banana bread. What's the difference? There's no. No. There's nutritional difference, but if you're eating diverse, it all spreads mm -hmm. out. Right? So do we have to micromanage this whole thing? But, Robin, you know, one of the coolest things out of all this, too, is how many days I would sit there for how many how many years I've been, you know, meditating a little bit every day, and it's like all of a sudden I have better mind awareness than I ever did because I'm constantly listening to my body. Yeah, and it doesn't have, well, you don't have the stress of the body. That's the difference. And, and it's like a new world is opening up to me because when you're always aware, then you get out of your head. You're like, you're living in the moment, you're enjoying everything that's around you, and you're not in your head obsessing about things. Yeah, anymore. what you're describing is that, you, you, do you remember talking about the hierarchy of needs? Do you remember me describing yeah. that to you? You are describing what all human beings experience when their hierarchy of needs have been met. Food is no longer being threatened by your dieting. Your wow. food morality, the foundation of the hierarchy of needs is now secure. The second one, your shelter, clothes, you know, safety from the elements, that one has been secure. You never had issues with that one. Some people do. They hoard, they clean, right? They mm -hmm. compulsively buy clothes. The third hierarchy of need is that social pack. You've decided that you're, you're, first of all, you went and talked to your husband about your fear that he'd leave you. And he was like, honey, you're stuck with me. That was a big deal, wasn't it? Yeah. So we went into that. Who, who really loves you and what's your pack, right? And what makes you value as valuable as a human? You're the one that took that third hierarchy of need, which is your perceptions of your social um, pack, tribal worth. Your ability to be attracted into a tribe. You decided that you got, you're good enough. That even if you get fat, you don't care. You detached from that one, which is what ultimately stopped threatening the first hierarchy of need, which is your food, which was huge. That's what created all the panic attacks and the impulses to eat. So we removed all of it. And what happened to the syndrome? I believe this is a syndrome. That's why it so quickly dissolves. If this was a mental illness, if this was a mental illness, would this dissolve this quick with nothing, with no treatment in terms of medication? Yeah. No way. Right? If you had a true mental disorder that was caused from brain imbalance, first of all, the sign that it doesn't work is that medication doesn't get rid of it. That's a sign it's not a mental illness, that it is a syndrome. Okay, You, ha you had a syndrome. And to me, it's a social syndrome that is similar to Stockholm Syndrome. Right? You're holding yourself hostage to this social paradigm around thinness and health righteousness that exists. So you are one of those cult members. You decided that you no longer wanted to be a part of that cult. And what that did is relieve the pressure on your food and the need to starve. So what happened to your food impulses? Gone. Right? Yep. Right. So because you're no longer threatening the first hierarchy of need, you can have food 
whenever, right? The, remember that table yeah. of abundance? You now have that sense of my food is secure. I can have banana bread and it's not doesn't make my tribe kick me out. And if it does make the tribe kick me out, I don't give a shit. Yeah. That's what happened. I checked out of that club. Okay, so the symptoms that you're describing, I'm more calm, I'm more open, I have so much more compassion. What you're describing is how all human brains work who are no longer in a fight to survive. Wow. Yeah. It's not that, isn't it so much easier? Yeah. There's more grace, more lenience, more wiggle room, more breathing space. You're more conscious about what's going on. That happened prior to you having the banana bread. Your yeah. how you responded to the banana bread is because you secured your food and your culture and all of that first. Do you see that now? Yeah. There was a point at which you said, "I'd rather be fat and rejected than to suffer in this culture." I'm leaving it. I am no longer identified by health righteousness. I'm not a health righteous zealot. I'm done. I surrender that role. I surrender the body mm. that I think it's going to give me. I did, would rather not have that health. I'd rather have a soul. I'd rather have a spirit. I'd rather have a life. But it isn't centrally focused on the body and what it looks like and if it looks the way I need it to look and what am I doing today and how do I create it and how I, like, manipulating the way you look is something to be worthy of praise. Right? You left that culture. What's the likelihood you're going to go back into it? No. No way. No way. If you go back into it, what happens to this hierarchy of need with food? I'm sorry, if I go back into that cult... What happens to the issues with food? Uh, they go crazy again. They do, because they're being threatened again. You can't have banana bread ever again. It's so bad for yeah. you. Did you use vegetable oil? Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. <laughs> I know you're laughing because it's funny now. Well, and like you said, I would, it, it, I agree with you, I would rather have type 2 diabetes and be 300 pounds overweight than live with a, that mental illness that I felt like I was in a prison. Yeah, and it is a, it's a syndrome. I do believe it's a syndrome. But it I does feel, like, feel been, like insanity. I, I had known this 30 years ago, but I'm just grateful that I know it now because I, I, I just could not... You know how many years of my life I have wasted being in that prison, and I'm just—I'm not—I'm never going back there. Yeah, and you used to think that it was the best thing, don't you? Do you remember thinking this is the best way to live? Well, I didn't know any other way. I know. It was the only way. Until you were miserable, and you realized and saw the link between the two—the misery and the belief system—they're totally tied together, aren't they? Yeah, and I had social phobias. I couldn't go out and eat with people because they didn't eat the same way I did. And it was like I had no friends because my friends were limited according to who ate like I did and nobody did. So it was just, you I'm know, so every you. life was wrapped around all that and it was just, it was craziness. I know. And it's silly. But yeah. when you're in it, it's like serious, so serious. Oh, Don't yeah. you know what's in that food? It's serious. And then they'll use the statistics of America's health problems, which is a direct link to this issue. Wouldn't you agree? It's like, well, no, mm -hmm. duh. You're fear-mongering people. What do you think that does with their relationship with food? You're shaming people because of the way they look. What do you think that does? to their issues with food. I mean, I need you to see, you can see it more clearly now, right? If you turn I around mean, and look at that culture, the mo most of them are morbidly obese. Right. Or overweight, or battling their weight. That's the issue. And, and inside it, guess what they're telling people? You're addicted to that food. We told you it's bad for you. And oh my God, it's addictive. You should eliminate it. And where do you think that's, what solution is that gonna bring? Make it Thank you. You've had your own, everybody I talk to, it's worse. It's way worse.
Binges are worse. The cycles of binges are worse. And you constantly feel that you're flawed. And this is permanent because it's genetic. That is... You can have something that's exactly what you want. Yeah. This is what I see across the board. As soon as you get rid of this body image idol, the issues with food go away. Right? But that's the hardest part, getting rid of the idol. You have to really question the beliefs around thin supremacy. Do you see it now as a form of superiority? Yeah. It's ego. And they've attached survival to it. You're not you're not going to be acceptable in our group. I mean, you just said you would not go out with people if they didn't eat the same way you did. If they didn't believe the same things you did, you couldn't do it. It was so full of social anxiety and panic. There you have it, my friend. This is what it feels like when you are not surviving and you're trying to. It feels like panic, obsessive compulsiveness, right? You said, I have OCD. Do you have it now? Um, I don't call it. I still have some weird traits that I, I'm not really sure if they're OCD or not, but I don't attach me to, you know, like I still have a list to do. But it's like, if I start doing one thing, and it's like, you know, I just don't feel like doing it now. Then I'll do something else. So okay, you don't have anxiety about that anymore? No. Okay, no. you used to. Last week, you were describing, I have these lists, and it overwhelms me, and I just stop, and I start eating. Yeah. Yeah, that's gone, right? Yeah, well, you, you helped me a lot see that a lot of the things I was telling myself were just causing more stress and more anxiety, and... You know, so it's like I give myself myself permission now that if there's something that I'm doing that feels stressful, then don't do it. Well, do give it yourself grace and lenience is what I'm describing. It's yeah. not avoid so that. Stop. It's just give yourself the lenience to do it the way it needs to be done so it's less stressful. Right? And it's so much, even with the food, it's um, instead of that I can't have, it's like I don't want. It's that it can't have has changed as you don't want. Yeah, because you can have it when you do want it. Right. right. That's the difference. When you yeah. do want it, you can have it. When you don't want it, you don't have to because you can have it when you do. You don't have to because you can have it when you do. Do you see how that's like it's still there? It's the table of abundance. It's a big deal in terms of your brain wiring, all human brain wiring. The first hierarchy of need psychologically is food. As soon as you say you can't have this or it's going away, what's going to happen to everybody's brain around food? They go crazy and yes. want to eat it, mm -hmm. it and want to be obsessed about it. Yeah, the concept of like the holiday season, people think this is the only time I can eat this food. In reality, is that true? No, you can have pumpkin pie anytime you want. Anytime you want. You can make it anytime you want. You can have it anytime you want. Yep. So do you have to eat as much as you can in that one sitting? No. Do you, but you do if you tell yourself that you're not going to eat anymore. Right? This is a special occasion. I never get this. And I'm not going to. Because it's the new year. I'm going to fix it all. I'm going to go on a carb-restricted bullshit diet. Right? Crazy. <laughs> you hear it now. And you're just like, oh my gosh. This is crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. crazy. And it all stems from this identity around your body. Yeah. Wow. I think everybody has to go through it. Everybody, you are not your body. You're not. If you are, that means if you lose your legs, you're half a person. And anything in between. That means if you're fat, that you are the perceptions around that fat. It's a very low state of thinking. You know, that's the survival state of thinking. We got rid of the survival state. And what happens to your mind? What's happening right now in terms of your thought processing? Would you say that it's improving? Yeah. Yeah, significantly. You'll notice that your intelligence level over the next, it just goes so much, 
It's so much easier to think. All humans work that way when their hierarchy of needs are met. But if you create a belief system that requires extreme measures to get those needs met, it's vicious because the life does not work in an all or nothing way. All or nothing mentality is a symptom of someone who's not surviving. Uh, perfectionism is not a quality. It's a symptom of someone who is trying to survive. They have to have perfection. It's just a sign that their beliefs are above reality. And there's ego attached to those beliefs. They want to put themselves above others. So um, addiction, alcoholism, behavioral issues skyrocket when people have these beliefs. When they hold themselves to a level or standard that's above reality. They tend to have more withdrawal issues socially. And the behavior around addiction is that. So is the addiction the drug that they're using or the behavior that they use to feel better about it? Or is it their belief systems and what they hold themselves to that make them feel inadequate and ashamed? I know. You, do you see this clearly? So should we be yep. short, intellectually stunted by saying it's the drug? No way. That is, you're limiting someone's progress if they believe you. Right? Remember, when you're in it, it feels very tight and confusing. So it's very difficult right. to understand it. And so when someone comes ar around you and says, oh, you're addicted mm. to food, like they know, like they've ever felt this way. No. No. And if they believe it, and if they have had this issue, they're still struggling. They're not recovered yet. They're just trying to function with some kind of crazy train to recover. So they're they're basically still mentally dealing with it and trying to function with some religion around it. Anyways, all right. Thanks for letting me record this. You're awesome. Do you have anything you want to say to the listener? Um the hardest thing is the first few days of listening to your hunger, but um oh and don't get on the scale because that doesn't matter, and it just gets you back into the crazy train. And uh, don't worry about the clothes, whether they ever fit you again or not. And uh, if, you, if you're, if you you know, right at first, you got to be careful about when you talk to people that are going to be food righteous and in that mentality, because you're still a little bit vulnerable until you're clear of this. Yeah. So, don't you think, though, that you, that that was a good challenge for you? You needed to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So some of that is like, and you needed to weigh yourself and you needed to have some of that. Those things that made it this struggle, that's why you're where you're at right now. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah. So don't avoid the challenge. Just expect it, right? Okay. okay. You're, you're kicking butt. This to me has been, and you, you apologized last time. You're like, I'm so sorry. I'm a slow client. I'm like, no, you're not. Yeah, I thought I did. I did. Yeah, I'm like, you're doing it relative to where you're at, and that's perfect. You just yes, don't I judge your process. When I felt my hunger, and then I thought back about Sunday when I ate with, the, with my husband at the restaurant, I said, you know what, I think I'm turning that corner. I think I've turned that corner now. I'm on the other side. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? Like, oh my God. You should feel like there is this humongous weight off your shoulders, that there's no longer a noose around your neck. It should feel like you can imagine a life free, like that freedom. Like, in like, the, like been in a dark cave and all of a sudden I've come outside and I see this beautiful world out there. Yes, and you've been hiding in that cave afraid of the world out there, haven't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt too. Dark dungeon. It was a dark, dark cave with a boulder on top and I was trying to get out, but I was trying to stay at the same time and it was just worth, it was worth suicide for sure. Yeah. All right. I'll try to get this posted today, if not tomorrow. So thank you.